Hello everyone, this is an age-old question, one that has stumped creationists for generations and one that frankly we evolutionists are darn well tired of answering. Thus, this will be a presentation of why there are still monkeys. So let's jump right in. <laughs> It's a question as old as young earth creationism itself and was voted overwhelmingly in favor of on Twitter. The question of why there are still monkeys crosses a number of topics within evolutionary biology, including speciation, common ancestry, and extinction. It also involves a deep misconception on the part of the creationist. All of these must be understood if we are to understand why we coexist with monkeys, and why at least some creationists keep asking about it. First, what are monkeys? Monkey is the popular term for members of the placental mammal clades Platyrrhini, or New World Monkeys, and Cercopithecoidea, or Old World Monkeys. Monkeys generally have tails, although not all do, such as the Barbary macaque, and are generally arboreal, although not all are, such as baboons. When you list all the traits that collectively describe monkeys, you can't help but describe a huge number of traits humans and all other apes have. The reason for this is that we share a common ancestor with all modern monkeys that also had these traits. The same principle is true when you describe all mammals, all amniotes, all tetrapods, all vertebrates, all animals, etc. In animals generally, parents give birth to offspring that have slight genetic variations, which translates to having some slight anatomical variations. These variations can be harmful, neutral, as most are, or beneficial. The environment then acts on those genetic variations, called natural selection, although there are other mechanisms of evolution, which determines which of those variations will be passed on to progeny. The harmful ones are often wiped out, while neutral and beneficial ones are often retained. Oftentimes, gene duplications can accrue mutations and generate new structures and functions, such as the wing propellers in the water strider genus Ragavalia. Over time, if the population survives and divides, then enough variations can accrue in the subpopulations over generations, where the two halves of that original population can no longer interbreed with each other. This process is called speciation, and it has been observed many times both in the field, such as the marbled crayfish, and in the lab, as in bacteria. The resulting species will still be very similar in many ways. For example, the chimp species Pan troglodytes and Pan paniscus speciated from a common ancestor about 1.8 million years ago. These two are more closely related genetically to each other than to any other organisms on Earth. What does that mean? It means that there would have once been a species whose divergence resulted in what we now call Pan troglodytes and Pan paniscus. That ancestral species would have looked very similar to them both. How close can be imagined by comparing the two descendants? If the fossil record were less scattershot, we could identify that species, and if we had their genomes to inspect, we could identify all the mutations underlying the differences their descendants display. But at no point was there some biological requirement that Pan troglodytes disappear just because Pan paniscus arrived, or vice versa. That's not how evolution works. It's the same process that goes on within a species. We share a common ancestor with all other humans on the planet. This is easily accepted, even among creationists, due to the sheer genetic and anatomical similarities we humans all share. Using genetics is how shows like the Mari Povich show get to say, you are the father. Organizations like 23andMe similarly use your DNA to trace your ancestry across the globe. This indicates that the last common ancestor of humans likely lived over 300,000 years ago. At no point did any of your distant cousins disappear from the earth just because your branch came along. Now trace the process back still further. We share a slightly more ancient common ancestor with chimps about 6 million years ago. Tracing our common ancestor with chimps isn't much different than tracing our common ancestor with all other humans. We share over 99.9% .9 genetic similarities with all other humans, and around 97% genetic similarities with chimps. And yes, even many creationists agree how similar chimps are to humans genetically. 
do that with gorillas, orangutans, and gibbons to find out that we're more closely related to them than any other animals, and you start to see a tree of life forming. Now let's get back to the monkeys. We share a common ancestor with the platyrines, remember the New World monkeys, that lived about 40 million years ago. The common ancestor that we share with platyrines would have also been a monkey since the first apes appeared about 18 million years ago, meaning that our common ancestor with the cercopithecoids, remember the Old World monkeys, would have also been a monkey, meaning that we are monkeys. Monkey then becomes paraphyletic, meaning it's a grouping of organisms that doesn't include all its descendants. For example, Apes aren't generally considered monkeys even though they descended from monkeys in the same way birds are reptiles because they descended from dinosaurs. We are also in a clade with the cercopithecoids called Caterini, meaning that we're more closely related to all old world monkeys than we are to new world monkeys. So let's combine all these different ideas. First, about 40 million years ago, there was a population of monkeys that split for whatever reason. One population became what we now call the platyrines, while the other became what we call the catarines. Both populations went down their own separate evolutionary roads, speciating for millions of years up to the present day. And just because a new species formed, that doesn't mean the original species had to go extinct. In the case of the marbled crayfish, Procambarus virginalis, mentioned earlier, the original species, Procambarus phallax, didn't go extinct immediately after the new species formed. This is observation, not guesswork. So, our common ancestor with modern platyrines broke into two populations that went down separate evolutionary paths. The same happened when our ancestors split from our common ancestor with modern cercopithecoids, and with gibbons, and with orangutans, and with gorillas, and with chimps. We aren't directly descended from any of these primates, but share common ancestors with all of them. Even the creationist organization Answers in Genesis understands all of this. Creationist Tommy Mitchell wrote in 2010 the article, If humans evolved from apes, why do apes exist today? That outlines this whole process. If even Answers in Genesis acknowledges that it's a bad argument to use, then I think it should be avoided. So, we evolved from a series of common ancestors with modern apes and monkeys. And there is no reason to think why the birth of a daughter species should mean the extinction of a parent species. And thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.